Okay, so I want to start talking about the diversity of life here as we look at this uh, um, super cool owl flying through the redwood forest in Northern California. Um, we'll go over a few things. We might not get to everything today, but um, we want to start off talking about what is biodiversity and then talk about where it comes from, how much is out there, uh, how, does stuff, how does stuff change you know, back in the day versus now, and any obvious uh, particular trends. So the first step, what I'd like you guys to do, is um, turn to somebody next. Do we have an even number of people here today? One, two, three. Yes, we do. OK, great. So, so turn to somebody uh, across from you. Or if, there, if you don't have someone, then scooch over. And um, just take a quick five minutes. I want you all, in your own words, own, own, own thoughts, to define biodiversity in one sentence. And so scooch and, and, and get with one partner and uh, introduce yourselves and give him or her what you think your one sentence is and then she can or he can give uh, you theirs. Ready, set, go. Okay, okay, good. So, so you guys mostly focused on uh, variation, right? On, on, on uh, differences, right? Which is, which is totally cool and, and good. So let's talk about what we mean by biodiversity. Um, obviously, biodiversity is a contraction of, bio, of the two words biological diversity. And this should be obvious from all the readings we've been doing. Um, uh, uh, a textbook definition would be something like the variety of life in all its forms from genes to ecosystems often interpreted as composition, structure, and or function. So we'll talk about that in a sec. But um, so, so uh, often these three levels are, are key. Um, the first person to coin this was in a paper, this guy named Walter Rosen in 1986. Um, the actual, the term biodiversity is one, one unified word. Nobody re really paid that much attention until uh, basically a workshop about a year and a half later. Um, and the, the proceedings from that workshop ultimately came out as this book. And you've actually already read a, a couple chapters from this book in uh, previous week's readings. Um, uh, Basically, people came and gave a little talk, and this was really where we first saw biodiversity get, get introduced. And from that point, in the mid-late 80s, um, it just exploded, right? So this is an example of going to one of our um, databases, our, 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 lit, our um, primary scientific literature databases, academic journal databases, and searching for different terms, right? And so what we see is back in 1986, if we search for the term biological diversity, we were getting on the order of about 10 to 15 papers or so published a year, right? Over time, it's increased. Um, and the same thing, ecological diversity, there's a couple papers here and there, but, but you know, it also is increasing over time. But there was nothing for biodiversity until uh, you know, a, a bit after that, that big workshop where people started hearing about it. And then it exploded. So then here's another way to look at it. This is Google's Ngram, which looks at things like popular books and all kinds of stuff on the, that are scanned into publicly accessible databases. So, so, th so this um, y-axis is a bit weird. It just is a relative measure is all, all you should think about it as. And so ecological diversity looks pretty much flat because it's so comparatively low. So people do say it, but it's you know, a little bit. Biological diversity has kind of gone up and then sort of tanked a little bit. Um, biodiversity has peaked around um, the, the early 2000s and has is, and is declined a little bit, but is still by far the most popular term. Um, and so this word has crept into not just academic literature, but also the public, you know, newspaper articles, magazines, uh, 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 you know, television shows, all that kind of stuff. So biodiversity has really um, come onto its own um, in the last few decades, really paralleling the rise of the field of conservation biology. Let's talk about some official uh, definitions of biodiversity. Um, so this is from the US Congress. This is the Office of Technology Assessment. So this is one of the, the uh, nonpartisan entities um, of Congress that helps sort of you know, make sure we're all using the right, right terms or the right measures or what have you. And in, they, um, in, in a report from 1987, um, they uh, defined <coughs> biodiversity, Gesundheit, or biodiversity, same thing, as the variety and variability among living organisms and the ecological complexes in which they occur. So this definition 
talks about those things that you guys mentioned, the diversity, but we're also adding in not just the, the, the things themselves on a, in a museum somewhere, but actually how they interact with ecosystems, right? How they interact with, with the living systems of the planet. Okay, so that, that's a, a U.S. Congress's uh, definition. That's 1987. Okay. Next is a World Resources Institute, an environmental NGO. And uh, a little bit after this, in 1992, they published a report called Global Biodiversity Strategy, and they said um, uh, biodiversity, very similar to some of the stuff you guys just said, biodiversity is the totality of genes, species, and ecosystems in a given region. So that same idea, right? Um, in this case, really making sure we're emphasizing genes, so including the genetic uh, 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 heritage all the way up to um, ecosystems. So that's the World Resources Institute. Um, another uh, report from the same time uh, that, that, is, that I like, and this is a little bit earlier than that last report, but, but here in this report, um, uh, the definition is, in the simplest term, biological diversity is the variety of life and its processes. So here, this, this definition is interjecting the doing of stuff, not just the, the stuff that's frozen in in a, in a chamber or a, snap in time, a, a, a snapshot in time, but rather it is the, the interaction, how things uh, move materials around, how they interact with one another, that that is a fundamental aspect of uh, biodiversity. Okay. And then um, uh, Reed Noss, who's a, a famous conservation biologist, in a paper, again, the same, same era, says biodiversity is not simply the number of genes, uh, species, ecosystems, or any other group of things in a defined area. Um, a, de a definition of biodiversity that is altogether simple, comprehensive, and fully operational is unlikely to be found. So we're, we're, we're trying to have a, if we want a, a quick and dirty thing, we can run out into that grassland and, and, and just throw it down. He's saying it, it's, it's all this complexity of life, and it's hard to boil down to one little simple um, measure. And he goes on to say, and this is why I think this is one of the best definitions, he goes on to say it's, it, it, is, it includes the composition, the structure, and the function um, of a given area. So what do we mean by these things? So composition. Composition is what we've been talking about so far. Composition is species richness. Composition is evenness. Composition is heterogeneity. Composition is, 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 you know, all my chess pieces. How diverse are my chess pieces on the board? That's composition. Okay. The categories of things. Okay. Structure is the physical, is the physical thing. Maybe it's a flat uh, area. Maybe it's a rocky reef. Maybe it's a um, rainforest with tall trees and canopies and stuff, right? So, so there's something also particular about the physical lay of the land and, 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 this, and the, the, the material structures of a tree trunk and um, a bird's beak and things of that nature. And then the last one, structure and function. Function, that's the processes. That's the doing of life. That's the competition. That's the reproduction, that's the um, disease outbreak, all that kind of stuff. So it's the, the composite, it, it's the, the um, tallying up of stuff, organizing stuff in terms of different groups. It's the, what is it physically like in the real world? And it's the processes that are going on between those. All of those things are biodiversity. If we only focus on one or another one of those, even though it, there's totally good reason for a particular study or a particular um, particular case, you might do that. Conceptually, intellectually, biodiversity is all three of those things, right? And so what you'll get is you'll tend to get the molecular biologists that think they know everything. They'll say, they'll focus on composition. Oh, biodiversity is all the genes in the world. Yes, but, right? When you talk to the field biologists, they'll, they'll say something like, oh, it's the, it's the structure. It's do we have intact grasslands and non-eroded non hillsides and stuff? Yes, that's totally true, but it's this other stuff, right? Um, when you talk to the farmer that's growing food, um, they say, hey, it's the processes, it's, it's the productivity, it's the how much biomass is, 
is able to be grown on per, per you know, meter squared basis on my farm. Yes, it's that and other stuff. So it's all these things together. Does that make sense? So the best definition is going to mention the composition, mention the structure, and mention the function. And so really, these things are interacting with one another, right? Really, these things are, are constantly combining and, and smooshing around and making funky new shapes and making crazy assemblages and having different uh, processes. And that's the beauty and the miracle that is life, right? Life on our planet. And that is what we're trying to sum up with this, this idea of biodiversity. I was very proud of myself. I found that animation the other day. I thought, I thought this, is, this is good. Maybe, it, maybe it's not interesting to you guys. But that trips me out when I was watching that. Okay. Okay. So, so that was sort of you know, conceptual. In practice, this is, that, this is what that composition, structure, and function, function is like. So here's an example from, say, a coral reef, right? And so one dimension of biodiversity is to go out and look, let's just count all the fish species, right? And how many are in, how many are sick, how many are um, palmocentrids, and how many are, 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 you know, Moorish idols and all that kind of stuff. And that, that's important. Structure is particularly easy to see, or the value of structure is particularly easy to see, or at least one type of structure here uh, on these coral reefs by these coral, uh, the, the thing that creates the bio, biogenic structure, which are the corals. So what we're seeing here on the right, actually, actually all, all these pictures, what we're seeing are little coral bombies, little, little, little chunks of coral here interspersed by areas of sand and, and other things. Um, we see a bunch of coral here underneath the shark. We see a bunch of uh, coral uh, fingers here underneath these fish. And those are essentially the dead skeletons of other corals, right? Other cnidarians. And so they're living, it's a living skin on the top of this structure, which um, creates a calcium carbonate skeleton that then future uh, uh, coral can build upon and grow. It doesn't have to be just be biological structure. No, structure could be could be rocks and other. It could be non-living material as well. How do you account for abiotic, right? Because that's like abiotic, not biological. Is that abiotic? Yeah, I would, I would say that's structure. That's structure. It's that, that that plays into both structure and function. So so the abiotic world, maybe it's water. Maybe it's how that water is coming down the river, and so that water isn't alive. But how that water moves, and 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 if it moves fast, if it moves slowly, that can influence say, um, how the baby fish move around in the water, or how easy it is for birds to feed on the insects on the surface of that, of that water body. So, so, so yes, this is not just life. The composition is just life, but once we leave the composition, those other two things, absolutely the abiotic world um, is, is interacting with all that stuff as well. And do they have like specific measures for that like composition, or is that kind of just like a framework? A specific measure for composition? Yeah. Well, so we talked about three of them, the, the, sort of the three generic ones so right, far. Oh, so sorry. So structure, it, it'll vary. So for example, for um, uh, my PhD, one way I measured structure was to take a chain, which is sort of a classic old school method. Take a chain with, with links, and uh, that's a given, uh, a given standard length, or a chain of about 100 links is the other common way to do this. And you take it and we'd lay it out. So I'd, I'd give it to Jordy and, and we'd lay it and we'd come up over here and we'd lay it. And so, so it would, we'd measure how many links were horizontal, how many links were sideways, how many links were upside down, that kind of stuff. So we could do topographic structure as one example. Um, we could also talk about um, uh, heterogeneity. So how, maybe it's not so much is it flat, horizontal, but, but how different is one chunk of our ecosystem, our, our, our area versus another. Um, so, there's, so it's going to be really um, a system specific and, and stuff, but there's many, many ways to measure structure. Cool. Okay. Make sense? And then, of course, this, this also includes genes and all that kind of good stuff. I'm not trying to ignore genetic diversity, but, but genetic diversity seems to get all the line attention, and, and it's really that plus all this other stuff. So really, biodiversity is all of these levels together, you know, in, in, 
intellectually it matters. Even though we might be doing a study just looking at the genetic diversity or a study just looking at the chemical diversity of you know, this reef or something, but, but true biodiversity is all that stuff. Okay, and so one, one uh, example of this is right here in our own, our own salt marshes. So this is, here we are in Magoo Lagoon, here's PCH, campus is right up here to the right. Um, and uh, this is a really diverse system. And so we could talk about diversity on multiple levels. So the genetic diversity, of course, right? The diversity of the landscapes where we have some of these areas that are uh, vegetated, then we have these tidal channels, mud flats, et cetera. So we can talk about topographic diversity, et cetera. And then, but then we could talk about uh, the diversity. And normally when we think about this, think about the system, we would th say, ah, the diversity would be how many species of plants, let's say, how many, how many salt marsh plants do we have, let's say, in this square meter or this chunk of the marsh, right, which is totally natural. But one of the neatest things, I think, are, are these guys. So, so this is, the tide has gone out, right, so this is a tidal channel, this is intertidal mudflat area, and um, the tide is out, and, and now the tide is out, all of these um, uh, white things have come out. These white things are these guys right here. These are Cerathidia californica. These are a horn snail, California um, a horn snail. So a mollusk that's making its living cruising around on this mud flat grazing uh, algae, grazing diatoms, you know, single-celled uh, 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 critters. And so they're, they're licking that mud and grabbing up the, the, the primary productivity and scarfing it and eating it and going about their lives, right? Um, now, uh, that, that looks cool, but in reality, there's a whole nother ecosystem, a whole nother series of functions, a whole bunch of other stuff going on inside even just this one layer. This is that kaleidoscope thing, right? We keep looking and it, and it, and it roses, blooms into something cool, something cool. So in this case, we have a suite of trematode parasites that infect these um, these organisms. So these trematode parasites get in, they castrate, ouch, they castrate the snails, but they don't kill the snails. To the point where um, if we grab a relatively large snail, which, is a, which corresponds to age, they get bigger as they age. So if we get a relatively large snail that's been a, alive for several years, we have almost 100% probability that it has at least one of these castrating trematodes inside of it. But, but this guy, these guys are all alive. So this isn't a kind of parasite that kills you and then you're dead. This is a parasite that says, yo, dude, I want you to do all the work. So it castrates the snail and it infects the gonads and that's all it does. So the snail is still living. Evolutionarily, the snail is dead. He's a zombie snail, right? Like Last of Us. So, so this snail is going around doing its due, grazing, 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 you know, ingesting calories, making a living, cruising around the salt marsh, doing my do, but he has no, gen no reproductive output, no genetic input into the next generation. So from an evolutionary standpoint, that dude ain't alive. Instead, all that energy, it goes into the, the, lar goes into the um, trematodes inside the gonads, and then those are shed out. And so it's a great way to make a living when everybody does the work for you, just sit home eating Doritos and watching TV, basically, right? Um, there are, uh, from just our site alone, there are, 19, there are at least 19 different species of trematode parasites, just Magoo alone, there's at least 19 different species of trematode parasites. <laughs> to complete its life cycle, this isn't a parasite that infects a snail and then comes out and then infects another snail. It has to go through at least one, if not two, other species to complete its life cycle. So for this, for this parasite to be in the, these snails, there has to have also been, it's going to depend on the species, a crab, a great blue heron, other fish, other things, so that it goes through. And then only one phase of the life history of this parasite is in the snail. So it's pretty cool. So now we have all this level of stuff. We have function going on. So if there aren't healthy bird populations, if there aren't you know, grazing crabs and stuff, the, there's no parasites. 
And so all of these levels of diversity have to be playing together to get this. So in this case, which might seem a little bit strange at first pass, in this case, a healthy system has a crap load of parasites. So this is how the system has evolved. This is natural. And in fact, we have an invasive species, Batalaria, sort of similar looking snail, that's invaded in recent years that doesn't host as many parasites. So that invader actually has lower parasite loads. So anyway, all that, that's, a, that's a, I think, a great example of, of diversity and thinking about it. So it's the structure, it's the critters that are there, it's the critters inside the critters, it's how those critters interact with other critters, all of that is biodiversity. Cool? Questions? Okay. Um, diversity has tremendous value. One that our society historically has ignored. We've ignored this because we've been swimming in biodiversity for all of our history. So because of that, we haven't paid super close attention to it. So let's look at a couple quick examples and then we'll take a, we'll take a, a, a quick break. Um, okay, so value of diversity ecosystems. Let's talk about um, a, a classic example here. It would be something like um, pollination and, and bees pollinating crops. So these are all different examples of, of uh, foods that are pollinated by bees. Um, I would say that, that this classic ecosystem service, perhaps uh, you know, 20 years ago people didn't think of it that way, but there's been such great work now people consider this a classic example of, of ecosystem services. Something on the order of two-thirds of the crops that we use <clears throat> for food um, are pollinated by bees. And, you know, it's, bill it's at least, conservatively, billions of dollars a year. At least, if we were to put a dollar value on it. What does that mean? That means if I had to go hire someone with, with a paintbrush to walk over to the flower and, and brush on some of the pollen from, from, you know, one flower and then physically walk over and pollinate the ovule, you know, pollinate another flower, at least billions of dollars if you and I had to pay for that ourselves or had to hire someone to do that. Is, is this kind of a similar concept of one of the optimal like, summer meetings we have last week? Yes. Okay. Yeah, totally. So t t tell, tell, tell us about it, since maybe you read it and other people didn't. Yeah, so this is totally utilitarian approach, right? This is like we're putting a dollar value. This is not saying bees are inherently valuable for bees' sake. This is saying like, oh my gosh, if we lost this critter, we would need to do something. So, so this, so, but it's a very powerful way to argue for something, particularly for folks that haven't thought much about this stuff. Um, something like, um, 15 to one third, 15 percent to one third of our food production in the U.S. in terms of the calories that we eat absolutely directly depends on bee pollination. Um, and as we probably all know, uh, Apis mellifera are, are, are European honeybees, which are do a lot of the work in commercial settings in places like California and the Central Valley and out here. In Oxnard and Ojai and places like that. Um, we, we've been having a massive decline in, in bee populations. So here's a super valuable thing. The dudes that are doing it are disappearing. And so that's, that's of concern. Here's an example of, of the value of biodiversity. So this is an old colleague of mine um, who, yeah, Caleb. Yeah. Right. Right. We'll talk about that right here. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Caleb's point was, hey, so um, some bees are 
not all bees are equally harmed. Like some bees are hurt more than others. Right, totally. So we have built our commercial industry around the, the, the non-native introduced, what we call the honeybee, right, from, that came from Europe, right? We totally know how to cultivate them. Uh, you know, I have a hive in my house and everybody has, you know, they're, they're very, very common. And so, um, so let's look at, so let's look at Caleb's exact question right here. Okay, so this is, so this is in the Central Valley of California and this is looking at watermelon uh, farms. And so this is, okay, so let me orient you. So this is species identity. So it doesn't, these are just different bee species. It doesn't, doesn't matter for our purposes what it is, but there's, so this is species one, species two, species three. Um, and so let's look at this first curve here, this first big one, okay? And so this is, uh, and, and then on the y-axis, this is basically how much pollination is happening. How many, how many pollen grains are being deposited um, uh, per watermelon flower per day? Make sense? So as we go up, there's more pollination, and, and this is just I species identity here. So let's start looking at this open circle, the open circle um, one. This is, an, and so we're looking at different types of farms. So this first one is an organic farm, meaning they're not using any pesticides. And pesticides turns out are a major issue as to what, why our bees are declining. Um, but that's not the subject of this discussion. So, so organic means they're not using that. So this is, this is, not a to this is a place non-toxic to the bees is the idea. And we've, we've located this farm next to some relatively intact um, landscape, right? Some, some oak woodland and grasslands and that kind of stuff. What we see is uh, the first uh, bee species comes. Oh, sorry, okay. And then this last thing I need to orient you to is this big solid line. This is where we've given so much pollen, all of the flowers are pollinated. Right? So you can always dump more pollen, right? more, more stuff can fall off, but once, once the you know, embryos fertilize, it's fertilized, right? You can't, can't double fertilize it or something. Okay, so um, here we go. The first uh, bee that visits um, is about two-thirds of the pollen to get to, to saturation. By the time uh, you look at the second species of uh, bee, and these are native bees, come in, Boom, okay, now we're, we're, we've passed the saturation limit. So all this stuff, so we have 12 different species at this organic farm, and they're, they're way supplying the amount of pollen that we need to get our, to, to, to produce watermelons, right? And if something were to happen to, I don't know, dude number seven or individual number, or species number nine, there's redundancy in there, yeah? So even if something happens, we're still gonna be sure that just about every season, just about all our flowers are gonna be pollinated. Right? So that's a great service. Next, we looked at, a, at a, a similar farm, but that was located far from an intact ecosystem. Right, So far away from the grassland, the oak woodland, the whatever. Here, we had, um, we, we had some of these bees show up. Not all. Not all 12 show up, but one, two, three, four, five, six species show up. But even once we get to the number six, um, we're only about uh, two-thirds of the flowers are pollinated. And if we talk about a conventional farm, so meaning one that uses regular uh, uh, neonicotinoids that are the particularly problematic for bee pesticides and other, and other pesticides on their, their crops and stuff, and is relatively far from that intact ecosystem, um, we have roughly the same amount of bee species visiting, but the amount of deposition, the amount of work, the functioning, right, that process is less. So we, th this we'd say, yeah, the, the, if we're just talking about composition, we might say, oh yeah, we'll say it was species richness. Yeah, this is, this is uh, at this farm, one, two, three, four, five, six species. At this farm, one, two, three, four, five, six species. We say, oh yeah, it's the same, but there's vastly different processes going on, right? And so, so as we go away from um, nature, so as we poison stuff and as we, as we physically come farther away, the services that nature is providing are less robust. Another way to look at that is with coffee uh, data from another 
a colleague of mine um, who did his PhD down in Costa Rica and now is a professor on the East Coast. Um, and so he was looking at um, uh, coffee, bean plant, or coffee plantations and how far those, those plantations are from intact forest. And this is what he found, right? So basically, this is how far you are from the forest, near or far, and this is how many bees uh, come to visit a particular coffee flower. And what we see is when we're really close, there's crap loads of visitation. As we go farther away, th there's this declining uh, efficiency. So that by the time we get to be about a kilometer away, there's very low uh, encounters of, of bee pollination. So all that speaks to the value of bees as but one example of um, diversity uh, manifests in terms of drinking coffee or, or eating watermelon. Okay, we'll go through this last exercise and then we'll break for, uh, take a little break here. Ecosystem services, what are they? So we hear the term ecosystem services a lot and my, my, um, one of my former professors was one of the individuals that um, really popularized the term. And I would say, um, maybe I would have done it slightly differently uh, how, in terms of how it was popularized. So this is a very useful term, just like biodiversity, very useful. Um, really, we oftentimes now, in shorthand, say ecosystem services. The reality is that there's we're talking about two different flavors of ecosystem services. And we rarely well define them. So I want you all to be to understand this. This is a good thing to make sure you have this in your notes, right? So when we, ecosystem services is an umbrella term. There are two main flavors of ecosystem services. There are functions and there are values. And depending on the audience we're talking to, we might emphasize more of one versus the other. So the functions are going to be the ecological, the biogeochemical, the, 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 the doing of life part of it. Okay? That is part of ecosystem service. The, those are part of ecosystem services. Each of those functions then has some type of value. Value is the worth that our society puts on that function. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean like this. So we just were talking about bees pollinating flowers. So we could talk about the function is the, the physical bee flying over to the flower, landing on the, the flower and rubbing his legs with the pollen and, and all that kind of stuff. That's the function. That stuff I just showed, those graphs I just showed you were functions. They were measured, measures of the visitation, the pollen deposition. We could also talk about other things. We could talk about things like fish productivity. How, how, how fast are fish growing? How much biomass is being added onto the bones of the fish? And we could talk about all these other things. Uh, 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 marsh plain being vegetated, maintaining biodiversity. We could talk about photosynthesis leading to, to you know, producing, of, producing sugars that then in turn we, we eat. We could talk about uh, erosion of soils. We could talk about the accumulation of silt. All, I mean, we could go on and on. We, we can invent all these things or, think, or, or, or conceptualize all these things, I should say. The value would, again, be the dollar value or, or, the, or the worth that our society attributes to them. It's usually represented as a dollar value. It doesn't have to be dollar value. But, but so, so the, the function would be bees pollinating the flower. The value would be that we get some crop out of this that we could go sell. The function would be fish productivity. The value would be this awesome weekend that I cherish with my son as we go fishing. The function might be a vegetated marsh plain and, and plants growing and, and having uh, biomass on this, this area. The, the value might be protection from storm surge during a hurricane. The function could be photosynthesis. The value might be you and I can breathe air, which is, I would argue, pretty valuable. Right? Um, we could talk about erosion is, is something that's going on as, as we're, we're, we're taking soil away from some landscape. The value might be you and your, your mom get to go hike the Grand Canyon and, and, and be inspired and, be, and, and see the beauty of creation and all this kind of stuff and, and the wonder of the natural world and all that kind of stuff. 
We could talk about um, our wetlands, for example, here, accumulating silt, pulling in silt from, from the, the flowing river. The value might be the fact that, that silt actually are, creates slightly charged conditions and pulls out things like heavy metals. So it acts as a pollution sponge and helps clean the water. So, so functions and values. All, any one of these bullets could be considered an ecosystem service, and it is. But because folks don't oftentimes actively define functions and values, sometimes we get confused. So the biologists might go up and be talking about fish productivity, and Joe Blow is like, I don't care about, why do I care about fish productivity, right? And if we're talking about to, you know, non-technical folks, maybe we talk about, hey, the value of you being able to go spend, you know, the weekend fishing. But then the biologists, people are like, what, who cares about that? It's really about fish productivity. It's both of these things. It's both of these things. And we just need to make sure that the audience we're talking to, we, we're, we're, on the same page. Because sometimes this has led to some miscommunication and people sort of not believing the term or, 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 or not, it not being applied as effectively as it could be. So ecosystem services are comprised of functions and values. Make sense? All right, so before we break, take a quick uh, three, four minutes here, and I want you guys to pair up with a different person, a different person, and I want you to name three specific ecosystem services here in Ventura County. Start with functions and then and then talk about the values. Ready, steady, go.